Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Commander Pod, your Magic the Gathering podcast for all things Commander. I'm Spencer Simpson. And I'm Kelton Howell, and this week we have a fun episode. We actually got a request from one of our listeners. Uh, someone sent in a request saying, one episode I'd love to see is your Under the Radar Bombs. Bonus points if they are cheap because they are unknown. This yep, one we so- thought sounded really fun. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about underplayed bombs in Commander. But the first thing we want to talk about is what is a bomb? In other formats, especially like limited is where they talk about bombs pretty regularly, like yep. your pre-releases, your sealed, your um, cube. I can't think of the other one. Draft. draft. Thank you. <laughs> draft. The big one. The big one, the one that most people play. A bomb is a card that will most of the time outright win you the game or catch you up if you're behind. Um but there are more strict definitions to this. One from uh, not the command zone. That is a commander podcast. Limited resources. <laughs> limited resources. The limited podcast. Yeah, that's one of my favorite podcasts. And and one of the former co-hosts, Brian Wong, came up with something called quadrant theory to try and help evaluate cards in limited to know if they're good. And cards are considered really good when they're effective in four different quadrants. And those are when you're ahead, when you're behind, when you're at parity, and when the board state is still developing. And so I I would consider the bombiest cards being cards that help you in several or all of those categories. Yeah, so if you drop one of these bombs when they have a full board, it will catch you up or put you ahead, right? Be yep. good in that situation. If you're or help ahead, you close the door on the game. Or help you close the door. Ahead. Sure, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yep. Yeah, and it's a little bit harder in Commander because yep. you have three opponents instead of one and so some cards that would be considered bombs and limited just are mostly unplayable to be honest in in commander you're just not going to put them in your deck for the same reasons that you would in limited yeah and most of the cards that are considered bombs in commander are absurdly expensive because they are they're (laughs) so few and far between things like cyclonic rift which is every (laughs) Helps you and hurts everyone, right? Yeah, so it's, and it's good in every blue deck. And it's good in every blue deck. Or things like Crater Hoof Behemoth as a way to close out the game. It would be a bomb in, in, in Commander. And those are some of the more well-known ones. And because they're more well-known and, objectively speaking, probably the most powerful versions of these effects, yep. they're played in very many decks and they're pretty expensive. So today we want to talk about some that maybe are more accessible and maybe you haven't heard of or thought of putting in your decks. Yeah, so the two criteria are, number one, that it's underplayed. So the way we defined underplayed was that it's played in under 5% of eligible decks in EDH rec. Uh, that's, there's, that's still quite a few decks, but yeah. Um, the, yeah, we had to have some wiggle room there. As well as the, for the budget, uh, something that's considered budget, we're just going to give ourselves a max of $5. Uh, it's not the cheapest card, but still reasonable and in, in within many people's uh, reach. Yeah, we yeah we know that's not necessarily like considered a cheap card. There was definitely a yeah. phase in my deck building where a five dollar card was the most expensive card I was putting in my deck, and that's yeah, also but for totally your bombs. Fine. But yeah. for the for your top end, that's going to finish out the game for you. It's okay if that is one of the more expensive cards in your deck. I think. Yeah, most of the time we do a budget night. I typically am putting in a card that's like yeah. four or five dollars, and that's and kind I, of the big one. Most of the cards that we've picked here are under a dollar. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so yep. they're we very give that budget. caveat. <laughs> we're going to give some honorable mentions probably at the end that yeah. are on the higher end of this. But yeah, most of ours are actually really cheap, and we're really excited about them. Uh, so Kelton, do you want to kick us off with with one of yours? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, oh, the, I should say, I'm sorry. We each, yeah. we each picked five. We limited yep. ourselves to five of them. We each picked five. We're going to show There are so many that we wanted to pick. There are so many fun yep. cards. I, I went through all of my deck lists and just some of my favorite pet cards, and there's so many. So I picked. Five of my favorites. The first one is Mob Rule. So this is four red red for a sorcery. It says choose one. Gain control of all creatures with power four or greater until end of turn. Untap those creatures. They gain haste until end of turn. Or you do the same thing but with all creatures power three or less. So you either get all of the creatures that are power four or greater or all of the creatures that are power three or less for a turn for like one big attack. Right, mm. And this card is 56 cents, and it's played in 2% of eligible decks on EDH rec. So I feel like this belongs on the list because it's a card that can be pretty powerful in most any deck. Uh, there's not a huge number of decks that... There's not a huge number of requirements for this card to be good. All that it requires is that your opponents are playing a lot of creatures. <laughs> yeah, And bonus points if they're all on the high end or if they're all on the low end, because then you get to have a huge attack with very few blockers. 
Yeah, well, and this one definitely, I feel like, fits the quadrant theory of when you're behind and someone has a giant board state, potentially you can blow them out entirely and win the game yeah. with this card. And when you're ahead, you get to get rid of all their blockers, or at least some of their uh, more key blockers. That yeah, there's just a really big chance that you either win the game on the spot with this card or that you el eliminate a player. That yeah. You're able to like get enough combat damage that you just eliminate a player. There are decks or types of decks that this card just really goes crazy in. So aristocrats mm. decks that can sacrifice creatures because then you can steal all of their creatures and just sacrifice them to a sacrifice outlet and now oh, yeah. they have no creatures. Uh, decks that care about stealing creatures. So one that's been printed recently that's kind of fun is Don Andres the Renegade. This is one blue, black, red for a vampire pirate uh, with power and toughness 4-3. It has each creature you control that but don't own gets plus 2, plus 2, has menace and death touch, and is a pirate in addition to its other types. And whenever you cast a non-creature spell you don't own, create two tapped treasure tokens. So you steal everyone's creatures, and then all of them get plus 2, plus 2, menace and death touch. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's really good. And they're so, pirates, so you have stuff that cares about and pirates. they're pirates, <laughs> you care about pirates. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple of other decks, uh, decks that can reanimate your creatures. So two of these that are particularly nasty are Hofri Ghost Forge. This is three red white for a four five dwarf cleric. Spirits you control get plus one plus one and have trample and haste. But the part that we care about, whenever another non-token creature you control dies, exile it. If you do, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a spirit in addition to its other types, and it has when this creature leaves the battlefield, return the exiled card to your graveyard. Still, their creatures, and you either sacrifice them, and then you get to create a copy of them, or when you attack and they die, then you, you get, get a, them. you also get a you copy also of them. Get a copy of them. Okay, so here's a weird rules interaction. Do they go into your graveyard? No. So this is actually. Uh, been eroded to say it goes to its owner's graveyard. Oh, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, the original printing of the card is incorrect. Okay, I was going to say that. I've never heard of anything that puts someone else's things yeah. in your graveyard. I know. That they, they, that was a little oopsie on their part. The The other one that does something very similar is Marquesa the Black Rose. This is one blue, black, red for a 3-3 human wizard with dethrone. So whenever a, a, this creature attacks the player with the most life or tied for the most life, you put a 1-1 one, one counter on it. And then other creatures you control have dethrone. And then whenever a creature you control with a plus one, plus one counter on it dies, you turn the card to the battlefield under your control at the beginning mm. of the next end step. So same thing. You Pretty good. Gets, and then you and then you keep them permanently. Yeah, permanently. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. So mob rule is cool because I think it's just good in most red decks because you're just stealing a bunch of creatures for one big swing to potentially end the game or kill somebody, and then uh, it goes really crazy if there's any synergy with with the rest of the deck. Yeah, I this is mean, but I really like the aristocrat strategy with that. I know because it's awesome yeah, if, if you've you got this risk here. <laughs> Oh my gosh! You just scry I'll take a all bunch. your creatures, swing in, and then I'm just gonna look at the top part of my library, altar, and then you can just like pump a ton of mana into your board. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's that's it's a really, cool, really card. cool. I really like this card. I'm surprised. It's been around for a long time. It only has two printings, but it's been around since Fate Reforged. I'm really surprised that it only has two percent uh, of the EDH rec eligible decks. Yeah, I mean, it's again, it's only been printed twice, so maybe that's why it's not as well known. I don't know though, because yeah. that's not the case for other cards. It came, it came in the Strephon precon. Yeah, it And did. I took it out of that deck. Maybe I should consider putting it back in. <laughs> it's just fun. I think it's also yeah, a fun card. That's a really good one. You've actually almost convinced me to build a Marquesa the Black Rose deck. I love Marquesa the Black Rose. That is Rose. a cool... The fact that they come back, and then if you can attack with them again after they die to get another plus one, plus one counter, they yeah. just loop forever. That's pretty well, cool. Well, if they, if they have... Yes, if they have a plus one, plus one. Yeah, yeah. and this it's is whenever really a creature, so if Marquesa has a plus one, plus one counter, she comes back too, right? Yeah, because she also has dethrone. That's crazy. Yeah. That's, yeah, Marquesa, that's... that's okay, I, Marquesa deck incoming from me, I think, <laughs> potentially. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I love it. It's right up my alley. Okay, my first pick, I also pick five cards, is Hoarding Broodlord. This uh, is a card, it's $1.42 and uh, is in 2% of decks. Uh, it was printed in March of the Machine, and I'll read it for you. It is a it is five black, black, black for a seven six creature dragon with convoke and flying. Will you and remind us says, what convoke does? Oh yes, yes. Convoke is that you can tap creatures to pay for 
each creature you tap can pay for one of the cost of the of the spell you're casting. I don't have the Convoke Rules text in front of me, so I'm nope, giving a paraphrase. Good. And it can also work for creatures. So if you tap a black creature, it pays for one of the black mana. Yeah, exactly. You can pay yeah. for one color pip of the color that it is. And that works for tokens that are, if you make like a black zombie token, it taps for one black, which is pretty cool. Yep. Um, so uh, Convoke, so you can tap your creatures to pay for it. Flying. And then what it, it says, whenever Hoarding Broodlord enters the battlefield, search your library for a card, exile it face down, then shuffle. For as long as that card remains exiled, you may play it. So you get to tutor for a card, and no one gets to get rid of it. You get to cast that whenever. And then it says, spells you cast from exile have Convoke. This card is so cool. And it sees a lot of play in CDH because there's like pretty crazy things you can do with it. And Saw in Half, which makes two copies of it, and there's lots of really cool lines you can go through with it. But I think even without those combos, it's just really good. Because it's a tutor, but also you can get it out quicker if you have creatures on board, yep. which you're typically going to do, which I think is pretty sweet. And whatever you tutor for, it gives it Convoke, so it's easier to cast that thing. So you can use your creatures to cast this big, giant, flying dragon, and then you get a tutor for another giant threat that your creatures can then help pay for as well. So it's it's really ramping you twice into two big threats, and that's really cool. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. And notably, it is just it's enter the battlefield effect. So... There's yeah. no sort of, if you cast it from your hand or whatever, which are stipulations yeah. they put on a lot of cards these days, which makes it really cool if you can like cheat it out somehow or like or reanimate blink it, it. Or reanimate it. Or blink it. it. Yeah. yeah, exactly, which is really cool. So decks this performs particularly well in, I would say, is just about any black deck that can play it. It's really, really good. Yeah. But I think it will perform especially well in decks that care about casting things from exile specifically because of that last line, which I glossed over a little bit. <laughs> spells you cast from exile have convoke. Yeah, so it's that not counts even just the one that you tutor for. Yeah, all spells. Yeah, that's cool. Which is pretty sweet. So notably, that that spell no longer has convoke if hoarding broodlord dies. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But um, I should put this in prosper. It's you should definitely put this in prosper. Yeah, that's cool. I yeah, it's really cool. I there is a time I'm gonna tell my favorite hoarding broodlord story, <laughs> which was I was able to reanimate a hoarding broodlord and go search for a toxic with the corrosive and then convoke with all my creatures a toxic with the corrosive. And it was like on turn four. It was pretty, it was pretty disgusting. The game ended. Awesome. No, well, uh, yeah. And I lost because everyone quickly turned around and said, Spencer's the threat. <laughs> yeah. The game did end. Just the game ended the for, for me. <laughs> too. Yeah. Well, my next card is Arachnogenesis. Uh, this is currently priced at $3.12 and is in 2% of eligible decks. When we say eligible decks, it means decks on EDH Rec that contain that color. So in this case, it's just green. So all decks that can have green in them, it's in only 2% of them. Arachnogenesis is two and a green for a instant create X one, two green spider creature tokens with reach where X is the number of creatures attacking you. Prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn by non-spider creatures. So the way this plays is somebody attacks you with a bunch of creatures. You cast this at instant speed. You create an equal number of one, two green spider creature tokens with reach. And then you don't take any combat damage, but you can use those spiders to block and deal combat damage to the attacking creatures. Um... I love this card. It was very expensive for a long time because I only had one printing, and it was reprinted in Commander Masters, and that has really brought down the price of this card, which is awesome, so it's much more accessible now. In general, I think that Fogs might be a little underplayed. So the Fog effect is when you prevent combat damage. This can save you and allow you to you know, then take a turn that they weren't expecting you to have if they thought that they were going to kill you with combat damage. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can sometimes, you know, crack back and, and, and win the game. The downside to most fogs is that it doesn't do much besides just preventing combat damage. But this fog prevents damage, gives you a bunch of spiders, and then ends up killing off some of your opponent's creatures that, that they weren't planning on, uh, on losing. So the only real downside of this is it, it prevents all combat damage. So, and you only get the spiders for the creatures attacking you. So if mm. someone has, you know, nine creatures and they send three at each opponent, you're also preventing your opponents from losing life and you're only going to get 
the three spiders for the creatures that are attacking you. So there's a little bit of downside. It works much better really late game when somebody's trying to just take you out and they're sending a bunch of creatures at you. Um, but it's just kind of a fun card. It, it does a lot of work. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. And it's I think this one particularly is underplayed. I don't know that I agree that fog effects are underplayed unless really? you are playing specific fog effects. Yeah, well, because this one is creating creatures, right? And so it's this has like some serious blowout potential. I think effects just like fog. I don't know that I would put fog in a deck just because, and because I think the downside to most fog effects is that it prevents combat damage for a single turn. So if someone's yep. swinging, if you have multiple people that are like trying to try to take you out or deal damage to you, it'll keep you alive for the one person that swings in and attacks. How do you, how do you feel about uh, darkness? So darkness is a fog in black. It's one black mana. Uh, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn um i don't think i like it better even though it's in a color that i play more <laughs> so i the reason i think fox can be really good is i don't see it even though they're really cheap i see it as a late game spell for you to like pull the rug out from somebody mm -hmm. when they think they're gonna win yeah uh, especially in a color like black where there's a lot of ways that you can win that don't involve sending a lot of big yeah. green creatures at people. Yeah. And you might need to last another turn or two in order to sure. combo off or or get your engine online. So I, I do think they're a little bit underplayed. Uh, but this one is an easy one to play because yes. it does so much more than just prevent combat damage. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I was going to say is that it, yeah. it, this one is kind of a no-brainer if you're looking for this type of effect. Yeah. I, I, th I think... You're right that there is some pretty significant blow up potential. I can think of a time that I recently died to an Acrome as well, mm. where it would have been great if I had, in response, cast a fog and then it's yeah. a complete blowout, which I totally understand. Arachnogenesis, I think, is particularly good. Yep. Uh, I do think it's not played in so many decks uh, because of its previous price tag. This one. Yeah. It hasn't caught up. Yeah. So it's now, it's $3. It was like a $40 card at one point. It was. It was, so it, it did not see a lot of play and I think it deserves to see more. I think you're right. Absolutely. And it's, it's good in, like we said, it, it can be good in a lot of decks. Um, but there are some that are very obvious choices like spider typal decks, <laughs> uh, she, she lob child of Ungoliant. This is from the Lord of the Rings sets for black green for an eight, eight spider demon with death touch and ward two other spiders you control have death touch and ward two. And then whenever another creature dealt damage this turn by a spider you controlled dies, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a food artifact with the food ability, and it loses all other card types. So not only <laughs> <laughs> not only are you creating a bunch of spiders, but they have death touch. So they trade one for one for the creatures that are attacking you. Actually, they just they don't even die because they don't receive any combat damage. They just kill the creatures yeah. that are attacking you. Yeah. Yep, and then you get all of those creatures back as foods. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It might. It's got to be like one of the best cards in this deck. It, yeah, it's it's fun. One hundred percent. There are a couple of other decks that can really utilize Arachnogenesis. Just decks that can multiply tokens or care about having tokens. So one that was recently reprinted, actually two of them that were recently printed, I think yeah. in the same precon, were yeah. Adrix and Nev Twin Casters. This is two green blue for a two two Merfolk Wizard with Ward two, and if one or more tokens would be created under your control, twice that many of those tokens are created instead. So you get twice as many spiders and twice as many spiders are twice as good. Yep. And then uh, the other one is Essex Fractal Bloom. This is four green blue for a four, four <laughs> legendary creature fractal flying. The first time you would create one or more tokens during each of your turns, you may instead choose a creature other than Essex Fractal Bloom and create that many tokens that are copies of that creature. It is a creature, not a creature you control. Nope, any creature. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this card is I have insane. misread this card so many times. Yeah, this card got reprinted in Murders at Carl of Manor. It's 14 cents now. That's crazy. Yeah, it's cool. Really cool for token decks. That is very good. The the precons from Murders at Carl of Manor were insane. The yes. number of really, 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 really good reprints were off the charts. I, I'm so excited about those commander decks. They were awesome. They were awesome. They put commander legends to shame. Yeah. Like 100%. You mean commander masters? Or commander masters, yes. Yeah. They're so much better. So much better than the precons from commander masters. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It, They're awesome. It makes me sick, actually, how much better they are than <laughs> the commander masters precons. Yeah, they're awesome. Okay, yep. So play Ragnar Genesis. It's really cheap right now. Yeah, Go it's buy fun. it. And it's I fun. Mean, and it's, ooh, it's good. Ooh, it's so fun to hold up that three mana in anticipation of someone swinging a ton of creatures at you and then just 
absolutely blowing them out. It's so fun. I love this card. It's so fun to resolve. <laughs> I thought it was four mana. Three mana is really it's good. Three mana. I mean, it is three mana still. You are holding up three mana for an instant speed trick. And if they don't attack you, then you're like, okay, like I'm kind of out three mana. So there is like a little bit of a downside there. That's why I think other fogs are pretty good because they're usually just one mana and that's not a big sacrifice. But this card is just so much better. It's, yeah, dude, it's a lot of fun. I don't know. Three mana is not a lot. Like there's a lot of remo like targeted removal at three mana that I think is pretty solid. Yeah, but we don't, really, we don't really play tons of counter spells that are three mana. I mean that's that's true. I just this feels a feels a different slot. It's I yeah. th I think it's I think it's it's pretty still good. good. I'm telling everyone to play good. it, but uh, yeah, yeah, you should definitely play it. Okay, <laughs> my next card. I promise they're not all going to be black. This one is um, is Archpriest of Shadows. Archpriest of Shadows. Archpriest. I'm going to go with Archpriest. Archpriest. Okay, Archpriest of Shadows. Archpriest of Shadows is three black black for a creature human warlock at 4-4. Four, four. It was printed at rare in March of the Machine. Um, and it has backup one. So backup one is whenever this creature enters the battlefield, you can put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. If it's another creature, it gains the following abilities until end of turn, which are the, the abilities that um, Archpriest of Shadows has, which are Death Touch, awesome, and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player or battle, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, this card is currently 37 cents, 45 cents, depending on where you're looking, and two, and it's played in 2% of decks that can play it. It was printed like last year, so relatively yeah. recently. Um, but this is really, really good. The fact that you can put this plus one plus one counter on like some nothing token that you control and swing in with it and it gains death touch which disincentivizes your opponents from blocking with their big relevant threats yep or if they do they die so it, it will either remove something or get something relevant back for you and then this sticks as a permanent on the battlefield that you can attack with on another turn and get something back i just think these yep. repeatable reanimation effects are so good they are really good. And it, it, this gets even better if you have an evasive creature. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a flying creature, chances are there's an opponent at the table that doesn't have flying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you just swing it with that. You get one of your creatures back, and there you go. You, yeah. you've, it's reanimated one thing, and then you can swing it with Arch Preacher of Shadows next time and potentially get something else back. I just think it's really good. I think it's underplayed. I don't think I play it enough in decks that I have that <laughs> want to play it. Um, and you play I, a lot of reanimator decks. I do play a lot of reanimator decks. This is in my Sadisi and Umori uh, companion okay. deck. It's good. it's such a good reanimator effect on a stick. And I think, especially in Limited, we talked about bombs in Limited. In Limited, having an effect like this on a creature is just like incredible. Mm -hmm. But I also think that's pretty relevant in Commander as well. Even though creatures are typically easier to interact with once they're on the board, um, I think it's just really good to have this yeah, we, on a stick we, because I mean, we play other turn. reanimation creatures like Shieldred. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. And that one is triggers once a turn and has some upside yeah. on later turns. But this one can have upside on the turn you play it, which I really think is which good. Which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anything. This goes in any deck. I think that you can play this deck in or this card in any deck that can play it. Uh, I think it does especially well in decks that have good reanimation targets. If you are doing any sort of self milling, any sort of discarding. Uh, after playing a little bit of CDH, I have started to value looting significantly better. Yeah. Especially in reanimation decks, because you can put <laughs> a relevant thing in your graveyard and then reanimate it. It's pretty awesome. It is. That that looting piece is a very key piece to the reanimator decks. Yeah, That's awesome. absolutely. Very Something cool. Something I definitely underestimated, I think, pr previously. In oh, me too. Strategies. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, I don't want to loot. That's way worse than drawing cards. You yeah. are a car you're a card neutral. But if you're if you are looking at your graveyard and if your deck sees your graveyard as a, an extension of your hand yeah. <laughs> to play cards from, then it's awesome. <laughs> yep, it's significant. Because a lot better. of times it's going to be easier to play the cards out of your graveyard than it's going to be to play out of your hand. Yeah, there's been a lot of times. This here's a little deck tech on reanimator strategies. Yeah. I there's been a lot of times that I've been playing a reanimator deck and I've had one of those bombs in my hand and a <laughs> yeah. reanimation spell and no way to get that card into my Ooh, graveyard. That feels bad. And it feels bad. Yeah, yeah. it feels really bad. So. Um, that has nothing to do with Archbishop of Shadows, except that you should play it in reanimator decks. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. My next card is Tragic Arrogance. 
currently sitting at 76 cents and 2% of eligible decks on EDH Rec. Uh, this is three white white for a sorcery for each player. You choose from among the permanents that player controls an artifact, a creature, an enchantment, and a planeswalker. Then each player sacrifices all other non-land permanents they control. So this is a board wipe, but be but there are exceptions to the board wipe. For each player, you get to choose an artifact, creature, enchantment, and planeswalker. One thing to note is that you can choose the same permanent for multiple <laughs> picks. So if someone has an artifact creature, that can be both the artifact and the creature that you choose. So this is good because most decks play board wipes. Five mana is not too much for a board wipe, um, especially because it's hitting non-land permanents, not just creatures. Like Wrath of God is a perfectly serviceable uh, board wipe. It's kind of the poster child for board wipes. It just hits creatures. For one more mana, you are hitting all non-land permanents, and you can make this hugely asymmetrical, right? Yes. For your opponents, you pick the 1-1 one, one tokens that they have, and for you, your giant 8-8 eight, eight dragon, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's a total blowout for them. So this I, I play this in a lot of my decks as one of my board wipes because, number one, it feels more interactive than just destroy all creatures, uh, because you get you get to you know do a little bit more selection and save your best card, and it's just it just ends up being super asymmetrical. And we like asymmetrical board wipes. That's why Cyclonic Rift is you know yeah. one of the best cards in Commander. Yeah, exactly. And I think one thing that makes this um, especially good is that uh, what was I saying? I just completely blanked. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no I don't worries. know what just happened. No worries. I did want to mention, I actually thought that this card was one of the ones that they include in a lot of pre-cons, and I just looked at the print history, and it's only been printed, its original printing was Magic Origins, and it's been included in one Commander deck since then. Mm. This has not seen enough play. This is a great board wipe. It yeah. definitely belongs on this list. It's really, really good. I'm sorry. I just, re I just yeah, regained my it. thought. I think <laughs> this has an exceptionally high ceiling and actually a pretty high floor. Like, mm -hmm. the floor is maybe one player is playing a Voltron deck, and they get to keep their creature, right? And no, so you choose. Right, but if they're playing a Voltron <laughs> deck, maybe they only have the one oh, creature Oh, I out. get what you're saying. You see I what, what you're saying? saying? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you may be forced to make a bad pick yes. on one of them. You may, but, yeah. but probably only on one of your opponents, right? Yeah. And so I think, like, the floor isn't particularly low on this. And I do think some of the bombs that we were considering have actually a pretty low floor on, like, mm -hmm. what they do. Like, you play yeah. it, doesn't something doesn't happen until your upkeep. Like, Archpriest of Shadows, I'll talk about. Yep. Uh, the floor on that is that you don't have another creature, you play it, and then you have to wait an entire turn cycle to potentially... And then you have a 5-5 five, five Death Toucher that has yeah. a really great ability. I mean, it still has a really great yeah. ability, but, like, it's not doing anything to affect the board state, like, sure. now... You know what I mean? And I think with Tragic Arrogance, it is, the, the floor is actually pretty high on this. Yeah, in that, I agree. But the worst case scenario is that all three people have one really big creature out, and that's... And you don't like, have any good creatures. And you don't have any good creatures, and that's probably not going to happen. Most likely, you're going to be able to hit at least Then just save people. it. Don't cast it. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. This is awesome. Really, really good card. Um, do you feel like it goes in every white deck? Um, like I said, I've kind of just started replacing my other board wipes with it. I don't mm. if I'm playing a white deck and it has a board wipe. I don't know why I would play this. Why I wouldn't play this over Wrath of God? Sure. Yeah, because it is asymmetrical, and that is that is actually a bomb. As I guess if I to... really don't want to lose my other non-land permanents, if I'm playing an enchantment deck or if I'm playing a artifact deck, then this would be a bad choice. Yeah, any sort of control strategy that doesn't rely on creatures probably would yeah. prefer just a vanilla board wipe or something over yeah. this. But, yep, it's a great card. Okay. Also, but to go... Hold on. Let's go yeah, back please. to your Voltron. Your Voltron example. Please, yeah. It's going to clear off most of the equipment. Yeah, I was, I was thinking that as well. <laughs> yeah. You get to clear off most of the stuff. Yeah. And... Uh, Low, very high floor. And is it... Let me read it again. Do they... Does it? Are they destroyed? Sacrificed. So it gets around indestructible on... Mm -hmm. Things like a dark steel plate, which I think is indestructible yeah. itself. Like, that's pretty sweet. Yeah, cool card. Play it more. Play it more. Uh, if I play more white, that's definitely going in my white decks. <laughs> um, okay, my next pick is Wilderness Reclamation. Kelson and I talked about this a little bit. This doesn't seem very bomby, I think, right off the bat. Mm -hmm. But. I think this appeals to me because I am I typically try to play decks that generate a lot of value over the course of the game. 
and have things to do on off turns. This is something we talked about in one of our previous episodes. Do you want to read the card? Yes. <laughs> Let me read the card. I got, I got <laughs> really excited about it. I'm going to slow your roll a little bit. <laughs> yes. That was my preamble to Wilderness Reclamation. <clears throat> Wilderness Reclamation is three and a green for an enchantment. Untap At the beginning of your end step, untap all lands you control. So, you cast this on turn four. Turn You untap all of your lands at the end of turn four. And then on turn five, you have five mana to spend on your turn, and then five mana to spend off of your turn. So, this does particularly well in decks that can utilize that mana, not only on your turn. And that is a really good way to generate advantage. And some of these cards that can do that are typically kind of expensive, like some of those abilities that you want to do mm -hmm. on turns that aren't yours. But if yeah. you just get free additional mana to do that, you don't have to hold up mana, and it could be really, really good. Yeah, really good call. And I really liked the way you laid out the scenario because you get the mana back the turn you play it. Yeah. So I've spent four mana to do this thing. I have that four mana available at end step, which is awesome, as, as long as you have ways to use the mana. Yeah, I'm going to give you one example that just popped into my head. Yeah. Uh, Gretchen Titchwillow. Oh, cool. Is a is a, a legendary creature halfling druid zero four green blue one green one blue two mana total, you pay two green blue, draw a card. You may put a land from your hand on the battlefield. Wow, yeah. Great. All of a sudden that becomes really really good, doesn't right. it? Right, <laughs> exactly. This yeah. obviously is an earlier game bomb, but this is the type of card that is going to put you really far ahead. Now later in the game, if you are behind, it feels worse to play. That being said, if you play this and you're behind, you don't have enough mana for other spells you want to cast, potentially, you untap at your end step. So say you have you like mana again. something like Arachnogenesis in your hand. Yep. You can get this down to generate advantages later and, get, and still be able to cast something that can potentially deal with threats that are going on. So this has to be good when your commander has a mana sink, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think this does particularly well in decks that have that w have mana sinks in them and especially in the command zone yeah. because you're guaranteed to hit those mana sinks and then you're not guaranteed to hit this card as you're not with any commander deck but when you do it can do quite well and probably just more controlling decks yep yep absolutely you're and i forgot to mention it is 70 cents currently and it's played four percent of decks that can play it so towards the higher end yeah. right approaching five yep but i think still not played enough because there are other effects that do this better technically speaking but I think this is a really good one that, that is overlooked sometimes. Oh, I absolutely agree. I, I, I want to try this in a deck. I feel like I do need to like build around it a little bit, but mm. not very much. Most of the cards that we've chosen here, we've tried to do that can just be thrown in any deck. This one has a little bit of a build around, but it's really not that much of a build around. You're going to want, you're going to have instant speed effects in your deck and you're going to hopefully have some mana sinks in your deck as well. Yeah. I do feel like, like you said, most of these cards, we have tried to make them pretty generically good. I think all of them are going to perform exceptionally well in specific decks yeah. and then be pretty decent bombs on other decks. And I think that kind of is a, a, a product of the constraints that we set on ourselves, which is yeah. they have to be a certain price range and they have to be played in few enough decks. Because those cards that are generically just fantastic bombs that go at every deck tend to climb in price a little bit more. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, my next card is Conclave Sledge Captain. This is five and a green for a 4-4 Elephant Soldier. It has backup one, backup one, backup one. <laughs> so just a reminder what backup means is when this creature enters the battlefield, you put a 1-1 one, one counter on target creature. If it's a different creature, it gains the following abilities until the end of turn. Trample, and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, you put that many 1-1 one, one count counters on it. So, Conclave Sledge Captain just has, has those abilities, has Trample, has whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you put that many 1-1 one, one counters on it. And then you can choose when it enters to give that ability plus a plus 1-1 one, plus one counter to up to three other creatures. Uh, what's cool is if you put them all on one creature, that ability that says when it deals combat damage to a player, you put that many 1-1 one, one counters on it, triggers three times. You you get that trigger three times when it deals combat damage. Uh, <laughs> this so card crazy. is so swingy. I love it. It just comes down and makes such impact on the board the turn that you play it. 
Yeah, that's pretty crazy. I when we were talking about this card, I had no idea that those were three individual triggers because it was backup one, backup one, backup one. Yeah. That's really, really cool. And it gets triple trample, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Extra trampoly. Super trample. Yeah. The, so I think that it's good because it hits hard the turn you play it, sets you up for future turns because, like I said, Conclave Sludge Captain just has that ability. So yeah. it's going to keep growing if you can get through with damage. Though at six mana, there might be big enough threats on the board that you don't, you won't be able to get through with him. But that's totally fine because you've made this gigantic creature. Um, which means it's especially good if you have any kind of evasive or trampoly threats in your deck. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Similar to Archpriest of Shadows, and I think most backup effects that have good... Yeah. A lot of them have some sort of, like, when you deal combat damage type effect. On any evasive creature, this is going to be absolutely... It's going to turn any of your creatures into a Westgate regent, right? Yeah. So it may, what's fun is it makes your bomby creatures more bomby. Like, mm. I... The, the the dream scenario is something like Ancient Copper Dragon. Sure. <laughs> right? And you give it backup three. You give it this ability three times. You swing in, do a ton of damage, create a ton of treasure tokens. Or or uh, Old Nawbone Old is Nob- probably a better example. Say, yeah, exactly. Old Nawbone. And then, uh, and then it just grows huge and creates even more treasure tokens. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. It's, so I think that this is a fun card because it also plays really well with your other bombs. So I think it's very fun. It's 32 cents. It's played in 1% of decks. Yeah, I think particularly underplayed probably does much better in plus one, plus one counter decks. I think backup oh, does really yeah. well in those type of decks, right? For sure. Uh, I mean, It did, if, it did in, come from the pre-con from March of the Machines that cared about one, one count, plus one, plus one counter. Yeah, it was like a backup deck, <laughs> It right? was a backup deck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's really, really good. Yeah, I mean, you have something with hardened scales or something that gives you additional plus one, plus one oh, counters. Oh, man. Everything gets plus two, plus two, Wild. or two plus one, plus one counters, and then still gets those abilities. That's pretty sweet. That's really good, because each one is individual, and so instead of giving a creature three counters, you're giving them six counters, which it's, just hard in scales. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> it's awesome. Really good. Um, yeah. Okay, mine also has to do with counters, but not particularly plus one, plus one counters. This is Sanctuary Warden. Sanctuary Warden is four white, white for a creature angel soldier at 5-5. Five, five. It was printed at Mythic in Streets of New Capenna. It has flying. And when it enters the battlefield, uh, sorry, Sanctuary Warden enters the battlefield with two shield counters on it. So for those who don't remember, a shield counter, please correct me if I'm wrong, Kelson, <laughs> is when this creature would be destroyed, you, you remove, remove a shield counter. shield counter instead. Yes, you remove a shield yeah. counter instead. So it's kind of like regenerate a little bit in that it's like, it, it's, it's, spe- it's just like one time specifically destroy effects too. Like yeah. I don't think I don't think exile counts if I'm. Yeah. It's just like one time indestructible, right? I think that was the idea. Yeah, it's like yeah, exactly. It's like one time. It's like it's how probably indestructible counters should have worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the same way that ward is how hexproof should have worked. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it ends with two shield counters on it, but it also says when sanctuary warden enters the battlefield or attacks. You may remove a, a counter from a creature or planeswalker you control. If you do, draw a card and create a 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature token. So the reason I feel this is a bomb that you should be putting in your decks, uh, especially in your decks that care about counters of any kind on creatures mm. and planeswalkers, uh, is because baseline, this card is enter the battlefield, draw a card, create a 1-1 one, one soldier that you can chump block with, and it can block for free mm. once. Mm-hmm. Which I think makes it especially good. And it's flying, so it blocks any relevant like flying threats. You really want to have creatures that have other creatures that have counters oh. on them. Oh, for sure. You want those shield counters on this because then you're just getting extra triggers when it attacks. Tons and tons of value. Now, I will say I think I'm a little bit um, biased because this one was a really good bomb in Limited. Like This was one of the best cards, I think, in Streets of New Capenna. Because it's so hard to deal with. And it's a 5-5 five, five flyer. And it's a 5-5 five, five flyer. Yeah. And it draws you cards. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's really, really good. I'm but I do to think... remember how shield counters played in, in Streets of New Capenna. It's been long enough now. I feel like that disincentivizes blocking. Like, it, it does kind of feel like they're attacking with an indestructible creature. And you don't want to trade yeah. try and trade with it. Because it's like, well, it's not going to die anyway. I might as well just let it get through. I feel like those shield counters are actually a pretty good deterrent. Yeah, they were super, super good. You only are blocking if you have, like, a bigger creature with reach or flying, right? Yeah. 
And then I again I don't how don't know how prolific uh, combat tricks were. Please, if you were a professional at the Streets of Nukapena, if you played a lot of that limited <laughs> and you have it, uh, if you have it memorized, please let us know. Yeah. Um, but I do think Sanctuary Warden uh, is a really good card that you should be putting in your white decks. Again, specifically decks, probably angel decks. It's a cool angel card, but yeah. also specifically decks that care about either tokens. But especially puzzle puzzle encounters. Because I do think making the tokens is also relevant in like an aristocrat style deck or a token style deck. Yeah. Because even if you don't care about puzzle puzzle encounters elsewhere, you can still just get rid of this draws you two cards, creates two tokens, and does some some pretty awesome stuff and is still a five five flying body. Yeah, this is great. What a great top end to your deck. Pretty sweet. That's super cool. Okay. Oh, it is seventy five cents. Yep. And it is played in one percent of decks. So not enough. Play it more. We gotta not get enough. that number up. Yeah, we're trying to we're trying to affect the market here by giving you some of these cards. <laughs> I bought a bunch of Sanctuary Wardens. Yeah, and... you're specking on Sanctuary yeah, Wardens. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. I so the last card that I chose is Debtor's Nell. I d- I don't know what a Nell is. <laughs> I feel like that's an actual thing. I I might have to look that up later. So, twenty five cents. It's played in one percent of decks. This is four and three hybrid Orzhov mana. So. Seven mana total. For an enchantment at the beginning of your upkeep, put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. So <laughs> the advantage of being in Orzov is getting to play budget virtue of persistence. <laughs> I was going to say, Kelton, is this an effect that's particularly sought after at seven it mana? Is. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'm going to read virtue of persistence. This was printed in Wilds of Eldraine. This is five black black for an enchantment at the beginning of your upkeep, put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control it does have an adventure so it has the sorcery lockthwain scorn which is one in a black for target creature gets minus three minus three until end of turn you gain two life this card is at cheapest printing 13 no 11 dollars and 16 cents so this is the same card debtors null is the same card except it's an orzov so there's fewer decks that can play it and it doesn't have what makes Virtue of Persistence like so, so good, which is the removal half of it. <laughs> um, Pretty but cheap it's still, good removal, too. Yeah, it's, it's good removal. It's yeah. I mean, the fact that it's giving you like early removal that you can then play again later for an absolute bomb, it, that's why this card is so expensive. It's why it's so good. But in a more casual deck where the games are a little longer, a little grindier, this card it overperforms. It's great. It, nothing happens the turn that you play it. You have to wait till the next turn. That's the downside. Yeah. But it hits any graveyard. Yeah, I mean, this type of effect people play a lot in black decks. You just talked about yeah. virtual persistence. One on a creature is uh, Shieldred. Yeah, the, the Whispering one. The Whispering one. Thank you. There's so many Shieldreds that have been yeah. printed these days. Which does the same thing. It does do stuff on other people's upkeeps. Yeah. But it does the, have the... And and I think it actually has an objectively worse effect on your upkeep than Virtue Persistence and Debtor's Nell. Because it's, only, that your it's only your graveyard. Yeah, exactly. I think yeah. it's pretty sweet that you can get something from other people's graveyards. They're, they're the biggest threats in any graveyard. Yeah. And I do think in more casual pods, having a seven mana enchantment last until your turn and resolve... I guess I should say this reverse order. Resolve and last until your turn <laughs> yeah. is, um, is probably more likely in a lower power pod, right? I, I'd be worried about someone just hitting me with a um, nature's claim. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but yep. in like a higher power pod at least. Yeah, absolutely. But I have played this in budget decks at really casual tables. And in long grindy games, it does just feel just absolutely miserable and someone resolves this and you're just and you're just like well okay they get the best creature out of every graveyard every one of their turns yeah potentially everyone's top decking at this point in like a lower power yep. game right yeah and so it, you're just it can really shut the door on a game yeah that's pretty sweet that's a really cool one i'll have to find i'll have to find a sweet or subject to put that in i did just google nell and i've been reminded and i'll remind you as well that it is the sound of a bell especially when rung solemnly for a death or funeral so like death oh. knell cool yes that's a really cool flavor for the card also i do like the art on the card it's pretty sweet that is oh that art is actually so cool yeah that's really good job kev walker i think he does some cool art actually i I recognize his name oh yeah yeah, he does some sweet stuff pretty sweet Uh, um put this in your decks it's only in one percent of decks is awesome this could this could go in your um oh 
what's his name? Radadrabic. Yes, it could this go in the Radadrabic deck. Drabic deck. I, it definitely could. I've powered up Radadrabic. I had in another seven mana enchantment that I took out of that deck. Oh, but yeah, it's 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 operating at a higher yeah. Power now, it's isn't trying it? to it's trying to cruise yeah. a little bit faster than than Debtor's Nell would allow. Yeah, but and and I th- will say in that deck specifically, the downside of Debtor's Nell is that it it can't reanimate it. It's, you don't get the copy. Oh, because it has to go to your graveyard, doesn't yeah, and it? And it has to be, it's a legendary creature. Sure, but you can steal legendary creatures, right? Right, right, right. Do you but get them I'm off the is, death trigger, or do they, is it, does the trigger happen when they go to your graveyard? Uh, it's off the death trigger, oh. but, like, I can't reanimate Debtor's Nell. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So, like, yeah, yeah. I, so I do have Shieldred, the Whispering One, in that deck, because yes. I can yes. reanimate it with cheap reanimation spells, and if someone removes it, I get a copy of it anyways, yeah. which is pretty good. <laughs> Um, I remember. Yes. Yep. Pretty. That's. <laughs> I've. I need to do some more iterations of that deck because it's. Uh, it can that be kind Thalia. of. Mean. Thalia gets really grindy in that deck. Yeah, it does. It really, really does. <laughs> Debtor's Nell is a quarter, though. So go yeah. <laughs> go into your change jar and go buy yourself a Debtor's Nell for your Orzhov yeah. deck. <laughs> My last card uh, is pretty cheap and played in zero percent of decks. <laughs> But that's because it was printed in our last in the last set. But it is a really cool card that I want to talk about. It is Conspiracy Unraveler. It costs one dollar and twelve cents. Played in zero percent of decks on EDH Rec, primarily due to recency. Uh, it is five blue blue for a creature Sphinx Detective. Uh, it's it's six six flying, and it says you may collect evidence ten rather than pay the mana cost for spells that you cast. So. Uh, to collect evidence, uh, you exile cards with that total mana value or greater from graveyard. So collecting evidence 10, you have to exile card, cards with total mana value 10 or more from your graveyard. Um, this is super doable in a late game. It is. We've talked about this before, and I mentioned that this does not look good. Like, the, the first time I read this card, I was like, yeah, sure, it's like a 7 mana 6-6 six, six flyer. But the other ability doesn't read like it's very good. Like it yep. does very much. But I think you could very easily rewrite this card to be seven mana, six, six flyer. On the turn that you play it, you get to cast two spells from your hand for free. Yeah. Without paying their mana cost. Yeah. Absolutely. And that is a good card. We would play that card. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And this is something I've thought about. If those are creatures or permanents, then those get on the battlefield. If those are instants or sorceries, they then continue to fuel the other spells you're casting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they go right to your graveyard, oh, which is pretty sweet. sweet. I was going to say this would be very good in a mill deck, but it's really, really good in a spell slinger deck. Yep, I think it's quite Ooh, good in a spell slinger deck. I didn't even deck. think about that. Self mill decks obviously does quite well as well. Yeah. This is one. Oh, treasure cruise? Oh, yeah, oh, baby. Oh, man, that's oh, sweet. Dig through time, dig treasure through cruise. Time? Oh, Delve that's away awesome. those lands so you have some stuff with actual mana values to hit. Yeah, uh, this is one that's pretty sweet in Tasser, the go- casual versions of Tasser, the Golden Fang. Mm. Uh, because oh, you can it's, pod for you it. You can pod for it. And yeah. when you pod for it, you can put Tasser in your graveyard instead of in the command zone and oh. then collect evidence from him. Oh, and to, then he goes back to the command zone. he goes zone. back to the command oh, zone. Oh, man, that's nasty. This that's card is sweet, way better man. than it reads, isn't it? Yep, it's yeah. pretty, pretty cool. This is one that I think should see more play, and I'm really excited. I do think, I've been looking through my decks recently, I do think I want to build a, a casual Tassiger deck mm. just to round out my Sultai casual decks. I love it. Um, and I think this would be really cool in including life. it. Oh, Tassiger is so cool. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, That's really awesome. cool card. What I think, the cards? Yeah, I think all these cards are very, very cool. I think you found some really cool ones. They were kind of difficult to find, though. They can be really difficult to find. Uh, but we wanted to try and give you an idea of how you might be able to find some of these cards in the future. These kinds of cards, these kind of top end bomby, maybe a little bit underplayed, maybe a little more obscure, cheaper includes. Uh, And I think the first place to do that is just Scryfall. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And Scryfall, it's a really, really good resource for finding any cards, but it can be one difficult and two overwhelming to just look through a giant list of cards. If you don't, know what you're looking for, right? If you're just looking for draw a card, like you search mm-hmm. for the draw a card oracle text, you're going to be overwhelmed. Yeah, too many cards. And so many of them are like, I don't know, enter the battlefield draw a card, which may not be what you're looking for in like a bomb. Yeah. So learning how to efficiently search Scryfall and how to, I think two things. 
two things will help you with Scryfall. Learning how to read their documentation mm-hmm. is huge because you can you can understand what search criteria. That being said, you don't have to type in the search codes. I do that because I've I that's it's much easier for me. Their advanced search I think is quite good. Is that what that's you really typically good. use? I use both. Mm. Yep, I use both. Probably probably 50/50. If I if it's I usually do like a preliminary search using mm. advanced search and yeah. then pick out the cards I think are cool and then I find similar cards to those ones through a more like yeah. narrowed search. Yeah, and, and I should say this does get easier as you become more familiar with Magic's templating. Yeah, because you, you start to recognize, like, we, we know the difference between the debtor's Nell ability, which is target creature from a graveyard, and then mm-hmm. Shieldred's ability, which is from your graveyard. And so when you're looking for the ones that cover more area, you know how that's templated, you know how that's worded, and you can search specifically just for that wording. Yep, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And there's also some different shortcuts you can do. This is something we've considered doing an episode on because it is something that really, really helps in the deck building process and especially trying to find some of these lesser played cards. Going through this episode, I looked through just a bunch of my decks that I had built and some of the ones that I haven't even built that I had kind of theory crafted mm-hmm. to find some of these cards. And it could be really difficult. And like we've mentioned a couple times before, because a lot of these cards aren't just generically good right yeah we tried to pick cards that were pretty generically good that could fit into a lot of different decks but some of the bombiest cards in your deck and some of the most fun to play cards are gonna be ones that are very narrowly focused on just your commander or that deck so like one example that i'd like to share is when i was building my baloth baratil deck this is uh i'll I'll read his card really quick he's four and a red for a two five legendary creature elf shaman Creatures your opponents control with power less than Baloth Baratil's power are goaded. Whenever a goaded attacking or blocking creature dies, you create a treasure token, and then it has background. So the background that I chose for this card was white. Um, and because it's goading smaller creatures, and I'm getting treasures whenever they die, I wanted ways to give my opponents tons of really small creatures. And so I used Scryfall searches that that narrowed it down to those types of cards. And I was able to find what's one of my favorite cards in the deck, which is Igonjo Uprising. This is X red white for a sorcery. You create X two two white samurai creature tokens with vigilance. They gain menace and haste until end of turn. And then each opponent creates X minus one two two white samurai creature tokens with vigilance. This card is awful. This card is <laughs> virtually unplayable in every deck except for this one where it's insane yeah <laughs> this card is so fun to play in this deck because you've accumulated a lot of treasures so you can you can spend those for a really big x to create a ton of samurais and then they all have to attack your your opponents and then every time they die you get more treasures back this is a very very fun card to play that really only fits in this deck and i was able to find it by doing that kind of skyfall searching so it if it would be helpful for that kind of a video that explains how to use Scryfall and give some strategies and some tips, let us know in the comments. Please let us know if that's something you'd be interested in. Yeah, it's it really is helpful to find these cards that are really, really specific to decks and become bombs in your specific decks. And so that's one thing that we wanted to just like touch on at the end here is we did try to pick cards that are generically bombs in any deck. Yep. A lot of the cards that you're going to be finding that really overperform in your decks are not going to be generically good bombs, especially if you're trying to stick with a certain a certain budget, which leads us into some of our honorable mentions. Uh, yeah, the other place that you should be looking for these kinds of cards is in pre-cons. They are printing, especially over the last year or so, they are printing a ton of these high-end finishers, these really fun cards that typically have been more expensive, maybe a little out of reach financially for a lot of players, and that's probably why they're not seeing very much play. And now they're getting reprinted, and the prices have come down significantly, and they're really good cards. So Pre-cons are a really good place to look as well. Yeah, absolutely. And the first one here that we wanted to just put in our honorable mentions list is Coma the Cosmos Serpent. Mm -hmm. It is currently $2.01 and is played in 5% of decks. Previously, it was pushing $13, $14, $15. Yeah. Uh, Very good card. It is three green, green, blue, blue for a legendary creature serpent at 6-6. This spell can't be countered. Ooh, that is what you want on a bomb. Yep. If you're going to put seven mana into something, you don't want it countered. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. (laughs) It also says, at the beginning of each upkeep, yes, each, create a 3-3 blue serpent creature token named Coma's Coil. So each upkeep, you're creating a 3-3 creature. 
It also says, <laughs> sacrifice another serpent, choose one. Tap target permanent. Its activated abilities can't be activated this turn. Or Coma Cosmo Serpent gains indestructible until end of turn. This card is insane. It's uncounterable. It protects itself. And in one turn cycle, it has created 18 power and toughness worth of body. 12. Plus 6 when you play it. It's oh, a six, you're six. right. Oh, in my gosh. In one turn cycle, you have 12 it's an additional. 18, 18 oh by my your first gosh. turn. Yeah, that's crazy. Which is better split across five bodies. Yes. It's just, this card is insane. And it just keeps going every upkeep. And you can keep it alive with the serpents that it's creating. It's awesome. It's so, so good. And it can, you can also disrupt other people, right? Mm-hmm. I think the, the ability that I don't think people look at enough is you can tap a permanent and mm-hmm. its activated abilities can't be activated. If you're behind and you're trying to survive a turn, sack a serpent, your creature can't attack me. Yeah. It's it's so, so good. And it's now, what did we say, $2? Yeah, $2. Buy yourself a coma. Yeah, do yourself a, a, once do again, yourself a favor. Once again, murders at Karlov Manor Commander Precon. Yes. So insane. What great value. So insane. Uh, Another one on here, while we're on the theme of Murders at Call of Manor Precons, <laughs> Rise of the Dark Realms. Yeah. Rise of the Dark Realms, phenomenal card. Uh, seven black black for a sorcery. Put all creature cards from all graveyards onto the battlefield under your control. Yeah, this is a finisher. This closes out the game. Yeah. Like, it's, it's hard. It's, like, I'm not going to say that you're going to win, but it is harder to lose. It is a lot harder to lose the game after yep. you've resolved a Rise of the Dark Realms. It can be countered, which sucks. <laughs> it can be. It can yep. be countered, but it's just an incredible bomb, especially at casual tables where you're less likely to see counters because people yeah. haven't learned how good blue is yet. <laughs> I kidding. love it. This, this is currently played in 3% of decks. It has gone back up in price. It dropped quite a bit. It is currently sitting at $9.37, but before, I think it was twice that. I think it was around $17. Yeah, it was previously. pushing twenty over $20, was I think, and it, it yeah. got down to like 3 or 4 So what we do want to say is watch these prices – Pretty soon after the decks are printed, because a lot of these really oh, big tank. bombs tank so low and then start to climb up pretty steadily. Yeah, one that's about to tank that we put on here with Seize the Spotlight. This is two in a red for a sorcery. Each opponent chooses fame or fortune. For each player who chose fame, gain control of a creature that player controls until end of turn. Untap those creatures and they gain haste. For each player who chose fortune, you draw a card and you create a treasure token. This, you called this mini expropriate. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and I think it is. It's so good. For three mana? That's awesome. Yeah, it's incredible. This yeah. one is Seize Play. One of the decks I wanted to build recently is a, a Dargo the Shipwrecker partner deck, mm-hmm. which is especially good with this because you either get treasures to cast Dargo mm-hmm. or you get creatures to sacrifice to, sacrifice to, to cast Dargo. Dargo. <laughs> oh, that's nasty. <laughs> which is pretty disgusting. Yeah. But it's a, it's a really, really cool card. It's currently $5.50. I would not be surprised if this is below a dollar or around a dollar after the reprint. It's already, it's already starting to tank because, I mean, these release next week or uh, tomorrow. If you pre-ordered, if you bought it from a game store, you can pick it up tomorrow. It's since, since we wrote this down, it's down to 482. So it's just going to it's going to tank pretty hard over the next week. So if this is a card that's interesting to you, pick it up. Yeah. And it should be if you're playing any sort of like aristocrat strategies. <laughs> yeah. The last one has gotten reprinted quite a few times recently, I believe. And this I think should be near, at the top of our honorable mention list. It, it is in 7% of decks. It's currently sitting at $4.02. This is Kindred Discovery. Uh, you may already know what this is because it's, it's a pretty popular card, but this is three blue blue for an enchantment. As it enters the battlefield, you choose a creature type. Whenever a creature you control of the chosen type enters the battlefield or attacks, draw a card. We were talking about this one today. Yeah. Uh, I was out buying groceries. We were having a chat about Kinder Discovery. <laughs> and I got pretty distracted thinking about, as you were pointing out, that this belongs probably in more than typo decks. And I have probably not been putting it in as many decks as I should be, especially in a more casual table. I am so surprised this is only at 7% of decks. Yeah. So the reason I think this card is so good is most commander decks are going to have some creature type that it has a few more of. Like, Mm -hmm. it might be humans, it might be elves. I was looking at one of my decks that has no creature synergies. It has 10 humans. It has 8 elves. And that's that's like 10% of your deck. Yeah. And and you have a commander that has at least one creature type that's always available to you. 
And so when you draw Kindred Discovery, when you go to cast Kindred Discovery, you just say, what creatures are in my deck? Which creatures are in my hand? Which creatures are already on the battlefield? And then you just choose the best choice for that. And all of a sudden, this card is already great, even with a very few number of those creature types. This is going to probably draw you in the next few turns three, five, six, seven cards. And that's a really good rate for three blue, blue. And then, and then the more tribal synergies you have, just, I mean, it just skyrockets. Yeah, absolutely. And it notably doesn't say non token, right? Like, yeah. Baseline, you're casting it, you're saying a creature type that your commander is, you're drawing a card when it enters, and you're drawing a card each time it attacks. But any deck that you, even is incidentally creating tokens, this is phenomenal. Yeah, and ex- especially token decks, like because you're going to just be creating repeatably tokens, like Bitter Blossom. This turns Bitter Blossom into like an insane value engine. Yeah, incredibly good. You're losing a life creating a creature that is evasive and also drawing a card. Yeah, so you're drawing it's, two cards off that creature at least. At if least. it doesn't get killed in combat, you're drawing at least two cards off of that creature. Yeah, it's incredible. Cards like Scoot Swarm. <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, you, you play this, name Insect, cast Scoot Swarm, play a land, you're off to the races. Yeah. You play this, you name Plant, and you play Avenger, Avenger of Zendikar. Zendikar. Yeah. You're drawing six cards off of it. It's just, it's it's an incredible card. You've convinced me this belongs in significantly more decks. I think it can be played in most blue decks and be very good. I've just, there are so many games where this, a game finishes and I'm like, I lost <laughs> to Kindred Discovery. Yeah. Like I, I lost because they drew 20 cards or even just 10 cards or even just five cards off of Kindred Discovery. And that is enough to put you significantly further ahead in the game. I, I've actually started to view this card as a replacement to Ristic Study in my lower powered decks. Like, I uh, we'll we'll talk about power level sometime here in the near future. So get excited for that. We generally talk about decks on a scale of one to five. Five being the 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 highest powered decks. I usually only play Ristic Studies at like four or five. Kindred's Discovery is Ristic Study for my three and four powered decks. Yep. Yeah, so, and, and potentially even twos, because it and comes in pre-cons, right? It's really good. Yeah, I, yeah, it's I come do down think... significantly in price because of some reprints in, in the Lost Caverns of Ixalan pre-con, and then also uh, it was on the bonus sheet for Wilds of Eldraine. Yeah, it's it so awesome. it's so good. It's It always climbs, though, so always watch out. It Those does. bonus sheets, I'm biting, I'm kicking myself for not having bossed off the bonus sheets. Yeah. I just wanted to say really quickly, the one of the caveats I was going to give to this was if you're playing a spell slinger strategy or one that doesn't care about creatures, not good. You're maybe not as high on this. I'm going to give a little counterpoint here. A lot of those play things like shark typhoon or, <laughs> yeah. or, um, the one that creates Drake's what's his name? Uh, uh Talrand. Talrand sky, sky summoner. You play this, say Drake, you play this, say shark. Yeah. You're trying cards. Yep. You're cantripping off of each spell you cast. It's, it's just really, I think this card is busted. It's really I mean, good. I and what you know what I like about it too. So Ristic Study is so good. Mm. There's a way to deal with Ristic Study though, and it's just pay the tax. Just yeah. we say this at the end of ep- every episode, <laughs> and we've never actually even talked about it. So that's why we say always pay the one. The, you should pay the tax on Ristic Study because that's a way to deal with it and not let it get out of hand. This is for the caster both more difficult to achieve because they have to be playing creatures, they have to be attacking with creatures. But it's also more difficult for the opponents to deal with because they have to block those creatures or prevent people or prevent you from casting those creatures. So I like that it's actually more work on both sides. It makes for a more interactive game than something like Ristic Study, but in some decks can be just as or more powerful than Ristic Study. Yeah, absolutely. You have the agency to, to draw cards off of this, which I think makes it especially powerful. Yep. Well, everybody, cool. that I think that does it for us today. Thank I'll you so much my, for listening. My Kindred Discovery soapbox now. Sorry, I'm all no. uh, heated up now. Go no, put this okay. in your decks. Play Kindred Discovery. It's so good, and it's only four dollars and two cents. Yep. By next week, we <laughs> want to see this in fifteen percent of decks that can play it on EDH Rack. <laughs> I better hurry and go buy them all up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, now I think we're done for the day, everybody. Thank you so much <laughs> for listening. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, we should have put the name of the commenter that suggested this. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, commenter. You're amazing. We're gonna we'll give you a shout out in the comments uh, and in the description. Uh, please continue coming to watch our videos. Thank you for checking us out. If you're new, thank you for watching. Thank you for sticking with us until this point. 
Like, subscribe, stick around. We do episodes weekly. Please come check us out again. We release on YouTube and on Spotify. You can find us on thecommanderpod.com. We're going to be improving that website, putting our Moxfield links there, um, putting some more interesting stuff there, so keep an eye on that. Uh, we have just... We're so excited for, for all the support we've gotten and so excited to have all of you. Thank you for commenting always. It, uh, we really feel the support, and we also hope you feel the support from us because we're here to help you build better commander decks, have more fun playing commander, have more fun in your pod. Yeah. We, we love you we guys. We love your comments. So, so <clears throat> let us know which cards from this you thought were cool that you might play in your decks. Let us know if you have really fun underplayed budget picks that you like to put in your decks. And uh, if you have ideas for episodes that you'd like us to do, let us know because obviously we listen. <laughs> yep, please. Please do let us know. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for coming by. We'll see you next week. And until then, remember to always pay the one. Bye.